her book is that she finished it in late 2019. So it's almost like a controlled experiment. It was pre-pandemic. It's easy to say that the pandemic disrupted the supply chain, which it did, and the war disrupted the supply chain, which it did. But here we have a very rigorous study of what was happening to supply chains before either one. And the answer is they were a mess. They were a mess back then because of tariffs on China and China redirecting soybean purchase orders from the United States to Brazil. That sounds easy because Brazil grows soybeans. Well, guess what? You got to get the ships to Brazilian ports. You got to rearrange all the logistics lanes. That was happening already. Pandemic made it worse. And now the war makes it uh, even worse than that. Yeah, the world is breaking up. Uh, we're decoupling. We're globalization is over. There'll be a new form of it. Uh, it's not the end of world trade, but you're going to see you know maybe the the five eyes you know uk us canada australia new zealand and friends in western europe form uh, a new trading block but exclude china and russia it'll be a little bit more like the cold war i talked to paul Walker about this but here's what happened in the 70s now it started as cost push inflation it was the arab oil embargo in 1973 after the 1973 war the israel arab war uh, then the arabs threw the embargo on us the price of oil quadrupled. It went from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel. It sounds cheap, but that's a 300% increase. And then uh, we had a severe stock market crash and recession in 1974, which at the time was the worst since the Great Depression. We've had worse ones since, but at the time that was the worst recession since the Great Depression. Then we come out of that and along comes the Fed, you know, and um, we went off the gold standard. Nixon uh, had an easy monetary policy in 72. It was a little earlier for his re-election effort, et cetera. So here comes the inflation. But what happened along the way, and then he had another Arab oil, actually an Iranian oil embargo in 1979 after the Ayatollah took over. So there were there were double oil shocks. That was a supply driven cost push inflation. But along the way, it morphed into demand pull. It, it morphed into a demand driven inflation. Now, I lived through it. I mean, I was a young up and coming lawyer at Citibank and a senior officer living in New York City. And that was the world where if you wanted anything, new furniture, TV set, vacation, whatever, you ran out, you dropped everything, ran out and did it because the price was going up so fast. So that's instructive in two ways. Number one, um, it shows that the Fed's always behind the curve. It shows that these things can persist a lot longer than people expect. But in my view, most importantly, because I think things are going to happen more quickly now, it shows inflation morphing from cost push to demand pull morphing from something on the supply side to a psychological shift on the consumer side. And Volcker crushed it, but um, at a huge cost. Unemployment was uh, about 11%. He took interest rates to 20%. How does that feel? You know, mortgagors and student loan holders and uh, others, you know, 20%. You're talking about 40% on credit cards in that world. And people forget, you know, well, it doesn't inflation, don't you have high growth or whatever, at least or low unemployment? No, we had stagflation. We had inflation and high unemployment. There were three recessions between 1974 and 1982. We had three, 1974, 1980, and 1981, which lasted until 1982. And by the way, uh, people lost confidence in the dollar. In the late 70s, Jimmy Carter's treasury issued what they call Carter bonds. The US treasury issued debt in Swiss francs. Now it was treasury debt, you had the treasury credit, but it was denominated in Swiss francs because nobody wanted dollars. That's how bad things were. We may have um, a very bad recession, possibly worse than 2008. So tell me why it's a buy signal for stocks if the Fed is throwing the economy into such a bad recession that unemployment is going to go up significantly and growth is going to come down and inflation is going to come down. Why is that a, a, a buy signal for stocks? Maybe at the bottom, you know, and the bottom might not be till late 2023. Okay. Yeah, there's, there are opportunities to, to buy the bottom, but we'll be nowhere near the bottom. Bear market rallies are, are really interesting. Some of the biggest rallies in history have been in the middle of bear markets where you ended up losing everything. But for a couple of days or weeks even, uh, uh, it's hey, the bottom's in, you buy stocks, et cetera. So you have, you have to watch out for that. So we're flying into a really bad recession. The stock market's starting to get the message, but you know, you've got this pivot narrative. You can't quite get rid of the some of the buy the dips people are still around. So count on them to, you know, buy into a, what could be a horrendous bear market. Uh, you got your buy and hold crowd. You know, remember in uh, 2000, 2001, the NASDAQ dropped 80 percent 
And a lot of people got out, but a lot of, they said, well, just hold on to it. Well, it did come back, but it took until 2015. I mean, it took, that's a long time. A lot of people died in the meantime. You know, you're waiting 14 years to get back to where you were. So, uh, so those people are still around, but there is what I call the pivot crowd. So the Fed pivot is a narrative and it kind of goes like this. Yeah, the Fed's tightening. We see that. Inflation is going to come down really fast. The economy is going to slow down really fast. Both of those things are happening. Inflation, a little less so, but the, the economic slowdown is there. And the Fed's going to get the wake-up call and have to cut rates. And cutting rates, that's the pivot. They're going to pivot from rate hikes to rate cuts. And that's good for tech stocks, so buy stocks. Now, that's the narrative. It prevailed in uh, late July and most of August. The stock market did go up. There was a, there was a decent rally uh, in the middle of what's you know become a, a bear market uh, based on this Fed narrative that they were going to have to cut rates. There are two huge fallacies in that uh, in that narrative. The first one is, uh, who says the Fed's going to get the message? And if you look at what Jay Powell said and what he repeated, we're going to raise rates, we're going to crush uh, inflation. Uh, you know, I've been following this for 50 years. I've, I've never seen a Fed chairman use the word pain three times in one paragraph, but he did. Uh, and he meant it. Um, he knows there's going to be a recession. They're causing it in, in part. Um, Unemployment's going to go up. He said that. He tied unemployment to um, killing, uh, basically, demand destruction and getting inflation under control. He said, we're, that's how we're going to do it. Um, and uh, you're already starting to see some early signs of that. So with that as their focus, who says the Fed's going to you know, get a wake-up call? Almost certainly not. I mean, they told us what they're going to do. They're going to raise rates. And then he said, if we see progress on inflation, we'll pause. But pause doesn't mean cut. It means just wait a long time because at that point, core PCE, that's personal consumption expenditure, core, which excludes oil and food, and that, that's just how they do it. That's their favorite metric. You can debate whether it's the best one, but it, the debate doesn't matter because that is the one they use. Um, that Let's say that comes down to around three and a half. Okay, it's still not two. Now, what pal, which is their target, so what Pal said is, we don't have to keep raising rates to force it to two. We just have to raise them enough that it'll get to two on its own. That's what they call a restrictive, a restrictive policy. So, but that's not a rate cut. That's that he said that might last for a year, all the way into 2024. That's when he was talking about rate cuts. Now, again, this, this can change, but but they've told us what they're going to do. I always say forecasting the Fed is the easiest thing I do because they actually tell you what you're going to do, what they're going to do. You just have to listen and believe them. Um, now, the hard part is understanding how badly they're going to destroy the economy and when they're going to get the wake up call. That's the hard part of the analysis. But telling what they're telling you what they're going to do is the easy part because they kind of tell you. So so the stock market notion that somehow they'll be cutting rates is just false. I uh, yeah, I was around for the 2008 financial crisis. I was around for 1998 financial crisis. You know, I, I, I negotiated that uh, bailout for LTCM. Uh, 98 was interesting because it was a an acute financial crisis that came very close within hours actually and i was you know i was in the room with the treasury and italian finance ministry and 19 banks and you know a thundering herd of lawyers trying to trying to save the world but uh, we we came within hours of shutting every market in the world there was a four billion dollar all cash you know you, could, you couldn't use the word due diligence because there wasn't time it was just hey the fed wants us to do this so let's just do it um so uh so that worked but um it was it was you know it was a very close call they would have shut down tokyo and then around the world london and finally new york and you know they would have opened days later but that's how uh, with trillions of dollars of losses it would have been worse than what actually happened in, in 2008. it didn't happen but there was no economic recession at the time that was and that's that confuses a lot of people because and particularly if you're if you're using 2008 as a frame of reference there are, there are financial panics and financial crises and liquidity crises, and there are recessions, some of which are severe. But they're two different things. Uh, 98 was a finan an acute financial crisis with no recession. Um, 2000 was a mild recession, but there was no severe financial crisis. Now, NASDAQ collapsed, but there wasn't a lot of leverage in NASDAQ. There was, there was no contagion there, but it didn't spread because it didn't, no banks, no banks failed, no major brokerages failed, et cetera. Uh, so, so in 1990, a mild recession, but no financial panic. 
uh, October 19, 1987, interesting, stock market fell 22% in one day. Not a week or a month, but one day down 22%. And that was a financial crisis, but there was no, there was no recession. Uh, so they're separate things. However, they can happen together. And 2008 was an example. There we had both. But I would encourage analysts to separate those two things. Again, they came together. It was it was horrific, but um, but they can happen separately. My my point is, uh, what's coming is a very severe recession. The uh, uh, you know monetary tightening you know, on top of a world where growth is decelerating, inventories are sky high. You know, the funny thing about the supply chain, we all remember headline, you know, supply chain is broken down, uh, you know, the, the shelves are bare. So well, all true, that, that was happening at the time. And that's when I uh, started working on the book. But what a lot of purchasing managers did um, and inventory managers, they they doubled their orders. They said, well, we're tripled the orders. They said, well, if the supply chain's breaking down and I want just a normal amount, I better order three times as much or twice as much just to get what I want. And they did. Well, what happened was by the summer, some of that pressure had been alleviated and here come the shipments into the warehouses that are twice as much or three times as much as what you needed at the exact same time that the Fed was destroying demand. And so demand drops off a cliff, uh, retail sales drop off a cliff, the warehouses go from being empty to being full to the rafters, and now all that merchandise is sitting there. So, uh, you know, Nike, I mean, just many examples. So what, are, what do you do when you're um, in charge of inventory? You cut prices. You, you don't want that inventory. It costs a lot of money to keep it in the warehouses, number one. Number two, a lot of it's seasonal. It's like who wants to buy, you know, summer dress in uh, December? Not too many people. Um, so they just slash prices. Uh, and that reduces margins and reduces profits. So we're just kind of flying into the face of all that. Uh, with the Fed tightening rates into weakness, the, the Fed will be the last to know because they're very model driven and the models are badly flawed, mostly with the Phillips curve and their focus on the unemployment rate, which uh, is is not a good measure of um, of what's going on in the labor force. So my expectation is the recession's coming. It's going to be really bad. Um, inflation is going to come down fast, but not quite fast enough for the Fed. Uh, they're going to keep raising rates, destroying demand, raising unemployment. And we're going to wake up with a, a severe recession, high unemployment, and a much lower stock market. You know, I write books and I also write several financial newsletters. So I'm thinking about topics all the time. And uh, there's always one, you know, usually you say, well, all right, the, this war in Ukraine is a really big deal. I've got to cover that. Or implosion, financial implosion in China, really big deal. I've got to cover that. Or uh, what's going on in the U.S. And and other topics, I could give you a long list, you know, we, uh, maybe the, the end of the dollar's role was a global reserve currency, et cetera. The, the difficulty now, they're all going on at once. Like, you know, any one of those topics would, you know, fill a newsletter or it'd be a big topic, a heavy lift, but they're all going on at once. And number two, they're not unrelated. There are all kinds of correlations, um, you know, the, the breakdown and collapse of the global supply chain, which preceded COVID. A lot of people say, well, you know, COVID came along. Of course, it messed up the supply chain. I, in my new book, I sold out. I've got very, very good documentation. that shows the supply chain was breaking down before COVID. Now, of course, COVID made it worse. Yes. Uh, and the war in Ukraine made it worse yet. Yes. But this really started with Trump's trade war in 2018. So um, that, like I said, there's a thread that runs through all these things. So um, when you ask me that, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, you want to talk about China, Ukraine, supply chain, they're all a big deal. Uh, the war in Ukraine is the most important because it's highly, highly significant economically and strategically. But of course, it's a human tragedy going with it. You know, if Chinese real estate implodes, okay, there's some hardship here and there, but it's not like uh, people being killed or maimed or forced into refugee status. And that is uh, part of what's going on in Ukraine. So that's a, a that's probably the biggest single one, but I wouldn't uh, miss the fact that all these things are going on at once. It's interesting because I do have, you know, kind of an international following, but there are certain pockets. I mean, there are certain countries where, you know, there's interest in what I do, or my books are published in that language, et cetera. So I have a good German following, and of course, the Germans want to know what's going on with energy, uh, Japanese following. So the number one question, uh, of course, every, everyone's concerned about inflation, but uh, there's, there's a big backstory there. But I always say, when it, when it comes to your own money, everybody has a PhD in economics. 
you don't need Larry Summers to tell you what's going on with your budget and your you know ability to feed your family or keep a roof over your head. So people get inflation. It's one of the reasons it's so politically toxic is because it's unavoidable. You can't fudge it. You can't spin it. So so people get it. But then from there, the question I get the most is, hey, Jim, is this going to cause a recession? Are we going to have a recession? And I use, as recently as a few months ago, I would say, yeah, I, I think so. You can see it coming. And, and there's data. I, you know, I never make statements like that without supporting it. There's, there's a lot of whistling past the graveyard. I mean, the stock market uh, is still you know, greatly overpriced. There's still, you know, the buy the dips mentality hasn't gone away. It's still there. You got people like Jim Cramer yelling, you know, and, uh, you know, there's institutional support. Uh, this momentum trading, of course, 95% of the trading is by robots. So, so all that's going on. So we haven't really seen the real, the, the market collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out. It'll get worse as the year goes on. I mean, that, that is my expectation. I have my own models and I look at it closely. But if you listen to you know, Michael Berry, uh, Jeremy Grantham, uh, you know, Charlie Munger, these people have been around and they, they run, you know, hundreds of billions. Uh, and uh, they're saying the same thing. So, you know, so every now and then someone will throw some statistic at me. And I go, well, how long is your time series? And I go, oh, we took it back five years. I was like, you know, talk to me if you've done it for 100 years, because that's a little more meaningful. But Jeremy Grantham actually did do a 100 year time series and looked at bubbles all over the world, you know, 1929, US, 1989, Japan, 2000, dot-com stocks, you know, and, and many others. And he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, it's the greatest bubble of all time, um, real estate, stocks, and, and other asset classes. So, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, that, that is my view, but it's it's shared by a number of other analysts. Uh, and, and again, you remind you have to remind people um Nineteen twenty nine. Everyone's like, yeah, October. Uh, I think eighteenth or nineteenth. It was late October, nineteen twenty nine. The stock market fell twenty two percent in two days. It wasn't one day. It was you know, it was like twelve percent one day, eleven percent the next day. So twenty three percent over two days. But that wasn't the crash. I mean, that was the beginning of the crash. The, the, this this Dow Jones fell eighty two percent from from top to bottom. Now it took three years. It, it bottomed in uh, June nineteen thirty two. Uh, started in October 1929, so not quite three years, but uh, that fell 82 percent, and and that happens. So yeah, we're down. Uh, you know, Nasdaq's down, uh, bounced back a little bit, down over 20 percent. We're in bear market territory, but that that's just the beginning. That's not what a full bear market, full you know market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that I expect. The soft landing is a myth. There's not going to be a soft landing. It's going to be a hard landing. That's not priced into markets. The, the markets are pricing in a soft landing. Or they're not pricing in a really hard landing. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off, or there's an embargo, or there's a shortage, of natural disaster. A lot of things is coming from the supply side, and demand is inelastic. So you just pay up, or you know, kind of do without. Um, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course, they're related. You know, it's like, oh, it's like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? You, to get the food, you got to fig, feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Huh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food. You got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That, requires diesel, the higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. Um, but, but food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So, so you have that, um, that, that cost push inflation. And that, and you see that in inflationary expectations and inverted yield curves. And I'll come back to that because that's a, that's a really big deal. If you thought inflation was going to run away, as it did in the 70s, uh, yield curves would be steeply sloping uh, and people would be in a frenzy to buy stuff. They're not. And the yield curves are not sloping uh, or upward sloping. They're inverted. They're going down. That tells you that, uh, and, and we also see this inflationary expectations. Inflationary expectations don't drive inflation here and now. What does is inflation here and inflation here and now can't feed on itself. Inflationary expectations don't drive it, but they tell you a lot. Their information rates to tell you a lot about what people expect. 
what the yield curve is telling us, what inflationary expectations are telling us and other factors are telling us is that, yeah, there's inflation now, but the Fed's going to kill it. And they're going to kill it by destroying demand and throwing us into a recession. And here's where it gets interesting, because you could flip from this kind of inflation to disinflation or even deflation very quickly. And and people are definitely not prepared for that. Well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. It, kind of everyday consumers are prepared for it. I'm not sure Wall Street and mainstream economists and policymakers are prepared for it. They're just extrapolating the inflation, saying, well, the Fed's going to kill it. Yeah, they might kill it, but at a price, at a very steep price. And consumers are really bracing for that. So the soft landing is 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 a, is a myth. It's not, it's not going to... There's not going to be a soft landing. It's going to be a hard landing, but that's not priced into markets. The, the markets are kind of pricing in a squishy landing or a soft landing or from the runways. They're not pricing in a really hard landing, and that is what we're going to get. It's going to get worse. Inflation's here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. Bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20-year decisions. The 10-year note is the right benchmark for those large, long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative place to put money. You can buy gold, you can buy a 10-year treasury note. So what's been true since last summer is as the yield to maturity on the 10-year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10 year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets. And I start my analysis in 1971, and I don't have to go through all, the, all that data, but that's that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said, no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. For the United States and sterling, I think it was four seventy-five. It could be off a little bit on that, but you know, four four pounds and and change. And as late as World War One, say nineteen thirteen, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to, you know, at the time Bombay, today Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. British sovereign is it's about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce; it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today, what are you going to do with a one ounce coin? It's worth you know, almost $2,000, uh, you know, you're not going to use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time. And it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was, the gold was the money and people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign, that's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971, when we decoupled completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3,000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. 
everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Whether it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. So that's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve System told all the banks, hey, send your send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and you know hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and it's there. And look on the, look in the assets and the first line item is gold certificate, and it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that that 11 billion is actually worth 470 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of 450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet, represented by a gold certificate. But it's not the gold, the treasury has the gold, and by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, you know, I'm just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hid it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it, and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously in the U.S. We still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half, no, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sale by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. Uh, if I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it now since 1980. The, um, whatever your baseline is, probably treasuries, you know, to your notes or five-year notes or whatever, they will come down a lot. Not right away. It's, we may still be a month or two away from, on this, but they'll come down a lot. The uh, interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates be um, 
you know, going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, um, as you get closer to recession, who who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, um, or even medium-sized businesses. Um, they see it. Uh, uh, you know, if you're in the trucking business, it's it's real time. Uh, you know, if inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed, you're not you're not moving anything by truck. Uh, so there are certain businesses that are concurrent. But the, the stock market is saying, uh, yeah, the Fed's raising rates, inflation's coming down, but we think they're already at the terminal rate. But not only that, we think they're going to get the memo that, that the Fed will figure that out uh, before they get to five and a quarter, before they raise rates in May, maybe even March, you know, maybe they're done. Um, and because of a recession, uh, this is these soft landing Goldilocks scenario where the market's right, the Fed's wrong, but the Fed will realize that the market's actually right and cut rates, you know, and if you're going to cut rates, buy stocks. That's like Wall, Wall Street always ends every analysis with buy stocks. So here, here we see Wall Street in real time kind of bidding up tech stocks because the Fed's going to pivot and cut rates. Um, when in fact, Powell's thinking, no, that's not happening until 2024. So that's what the Fed thinks is happening. Uh, the market thinks that Powell is over tightening, that inflation will come down faster and the pivot will happen sooner. And that's why we've seen a little bit of a rally in stocks recently. So, so you, you have the Fed narrative, that's plan A. You have the market's version of what the Fed's actually doing, which is plan B. My estimate is that they, they're already past the terminal rate. They don't know it. They don't think so, but they are. And as I said, inflation is going to come down a lot faster than, than anyone expects. Um, I talked about how the Fed is blundering because they're raising rates too high, too fast, etc. And they are. But the Fed has always said, we don't worry about inflation. We don't like it, but we know how to get rid of it. We just raise rates. And maybe they got to raise them longer and further than people expect. And maybe it's painful. There are costs involved, but they can kill inflation just by raising rates. They don't know how to stop deflation. I mean, how do you stop deflation? You can't raise rates. That'll make it worse. You can go to zero, but but that doesn't, once you're at zero, you're at zero. QE doesn't work, by the way. It's been tried to the tune of like $9 trillion, but the the empirical evidence is that it's just, you know, they, they, they do QE by buying bonds from the banks and the banks take the money and give it back to the Fed as excess reserves. That money never goes to the economy. What good does that do? And the answer is it doesn't do any good. It's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um, real estate stocks and and other asset classes so uh yeah i do uh, that that is my view but it's it's shared by a number of other analysts if all that's happening and the fundamental signs are also weak which we just saw in third quarter gdp which is based on net exports which won't last how, how are you going to drive a trade surplus with with the strongest dollar in 20 years Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. So with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? There are two different things. The global economy is is the big topic. That's what we all care about most. But financial markets can come up with their own narratives and go their own way, at least for a while. So you have to, they're not in, in sync. They, they do, they will be in sync eventually, but uh, not always right away. A lot of times the financial markets get ahead of themselves and then they wake up to reality and they oh crash you're know, correct down but in terms of the global economy um i think your use of the word global is very much on point because it's often the case that you know you look around the world you know you've got the united states or you know north america if you want to throw in canada you've got the eu you've got china you've got japan they're all important economies but they can kind of be in different uh, parts of the business cycle. And it's not unusual for one part to be in recession, but another part of the world is like doing better. So then they use the uh, phrase locomotive theory. You know, the locomotive is going to pull us all out of the ditch, you know, and, and we'll get going. So it's not unusual to have recessions in the United States or Europe or particular countries in Europe or Japan. I mean, Japan's had nine 
recession since 1989. I mean, nine. Uh, I consider that one long 30 year depression. That's, that's a debate for another day, but I would just, that's how I would describe Japan. But it, it usually, um, you know, one's not doing so well and another part of the world is doing better. Uh, that's not the case. What is happening right now, I see it, but there's a, you know, an awful lot of data to back it up is that we are going into or may already be in a global recession. So the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that. Um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal. But they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession based on, based on a lot of factors, some of which we've, we've spoken about. Now, the other half of your question, which is you know important to listeners, is what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and, uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. So the Fed story kind of goes like this. The, the Fed, uh, you know, forecasting what the Fed's going to do is the easiest thing I do. It's because it's not because I have a crystal ball or I'm smarter than anyone else. The Fed actually tells you. All you have to do is listen and believe them. Now, a lot of people don't listen or they listen like, oh, the Fed will never do that. They, they will. They actually mean it. You know, Japan had the famous lost decade. Well, the lost decade was 20 years ago. Started in 1990 through 2000. Japan's now almost at the end of their third lost decade. The United States has had a lost decade from uh, 2007. Uh, we're probably, if something doesn't change, either in terms of policy or a collapse, something gets worse. But absent that, uh, we're going to remain in this kind of punk 2% growth as far as the eye can see. You know, people say, oh, well, you know, uh, second quarter GDP, Atlanta Fed predicts, you know, 4.5%. Yeah. But we've had four and five percent quarters in the last nine years. They don't last. You get these spikes. You get a real good, you know, four percent print, and then the next quarter is two percent. The one after that is zero point five, or maybe even a negative quarter. So the headwinds, demographic, technological, productivity, psychological, etc., haven't changed, and there's no reason to expect they'll change. So you can't understand debt in isolation. You have to understand debt relative to income. And that debt to GDP ratio, which is something I spent a lot of time looking at, you know, the, the GDP is kind of chugging along, not going up very much, but the debt's going like this. The debt to GDP ratio is getting worse. Uh, looks I would say that the Fed's monetary policy will fail or is failing and fiscal policy will fail, is in the process of failing, even if gold didn't exist. If you didn't have gold as a, you know, multi-millennial monetary standard even if gold wasn't there as a reference point which of course it is but these policies are failing anyway and there are a lot of reasons for that you know whenever i hear you know fiscal stimulus i say well no the fed can print money all day long and the congress can spend money all day long but don't call it stimulus it's not going to have any stimulative effect we're way way past the keynesian multiplier which is now below one meaning if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar you don't even get a dollar's worth of GDP. You get some numbers, 70, 80 cents. They forget about the multiplier. It's actually now, uh, you know, a divider or something that uh, reduces uh, GDP. Well, you don't get the GDP for the borrowing. And same thing with uh, monetary policy, because uh, unlike uh, Milton Friedman, the monetarists, the New Keynesians, the Austrians, and everyone else, money printing has nothing to do with inflation. And they, they seem to, well, I don't know if they ever knew it, so I can't say they forgot it. So all the money printing and all the deficit spending will not stimulate the economy. And that's true anyway, but gold is signaling that. Look, all markets are try to be forward leaning. Some do it more successfully than others, <laughs> more accurately than others, but they try. I would, I would say that, yeah, people say, you know, the stock market is an efficient discounting mechanism for future events, for what they see in the future. And yeah, they look into the future, here's their forecast, they pick out a discount factor, they, they present value it and say, here's where, where stocks should be today based on where things are going to be, you know, six months or a year from now. And that's what they do sort of mathematically and analytically, except they're always wrong about the forecast. You, you got to get the forecast right <laughs> if the discounting process is going to mean anything. So markets go through the process, but they always get the future wrong. They, they're, they're not very good at predictive analytics. So um, this creates what I call the gap between the perception and the reality. Reality always wins, but not right away. Sometimes it takes a while. Gold, on the other hand, 
as very high predictive analytic value, number one. Number two, it's more forward looking. So gold's kind of telling you where things are going to be maybe a year to 18 months from now instead of six months from now. And so, yeah, so gold is signaling that monetary and fiscal policy will fail and something will else will be tried. Uh, and that ultimately will re, uh, you know, result in a much higher price for gold. So gold's just saying, well, let's do it now. You know, look, I've got gold at $15,000 an ounce by 2025. If I'm wrong about that, it'll be sooner and higher. But that's, yeah. well, I, I consider that a conservative forecast. And we can maybe take a few minutes to go into the analytics behind that. I, as I've said before, you've heard me say, I don't, I don't just throw numbers out there to get attention. I don't really care. I do care about getting the analysis right. And there's a number of different techniques. And what's interesting is they all point in the same direction. So, so you know, it's got to go to 3,000 before it gets to 15,000. It's got to go to 5,000 before it gets to 15,000. So that's my kind of long range forecast. But, you know, it could go down tomorrow. And I'm like, I don't get depressed when it goes down. I don't get euphoric when it goes up. I know where it's going in the long run. That's the important thing for if you're trying to preserve wealth and make money. You know, nothing wrong with making money. I'm all for it. But, uh, but sometimes preserving wealth you know, and risk aversion is a higher priority than just making a lot of money in the short run. But uh, either way, gold will serve that purpose and, uh, you know, and preserve wealth over, over that uh, over that time period. Could it go down tomorrow? I guess. Yeah. But all the vectors are pointing up uh, very strongly. And I'll give you a, a concrete example. There are three things that drive the price of gold fundamentally. Uh, one that you've already mentioned, which is real interest rates. The lower the real interest rate, the higher the price of gold. Number two, supply and demand. You know, you learn it in your first three days in economics, but it, it still works. Uh, and then uh, number three is geopolitical risk. You know, call it risk off or fear factor, whatever you want to call it. But I, I think of it in geopolitical space. Those three vectors don't all have to point in the same direction. You could have a situation where geopolitical risk is high, pointing to a higher gold price, but real interest rates are, are really high, and that would point to a lower gold price, et cetera. But right now, all three of them are flashing green or maybe flashing gold. The uh, real rates are coming down. Uh, they're still high, by the way. Uh, when, it, when I, I always have to just roll my eyes when uh, like really smart people uh, Dan Isaacson, uh, Bill Gross, uh, Jeff Gunlock, and I admire them all, and I, fo I, I follow them all. But they've, they've all been carried out feet first on this, you know, bond bubble thing, you know, the greatest bond bubble in history and short bonds and the interest rates have nowhere to go but up. They're, they're just failing to distinguish between nominal rates and real rates. Nominal rates are low. Real rates are not low. When I say low, I mean, show me negative 4%. That's a low real rate. Yeah, you can pick your notes or, or your bills or whatever, but I usually use the 10-year note rate, 10-year uh, treasury, because it's a good proxy for building construction, long-term investment. People don't borrow overnight to build a building. They borrow for seven years if they can, et cetera. So to me, that's my proxy for, for sort of economic growth and, and inflation forecasting. That's uh, it's what, about 70 basis points today, et cetera. But inflation is, you know, one, one and a half, uh, take your index. So that puts the real rate, you know, maybe negative 25, negative 50 basis points. Well, thank you very much. But, you know, I remind people in 1980, I borrowed money at 13%, but inflation was 15%. And my borrowings were tax deductible and the tax rate, I lived in New York City at the time, was 50%. So my real after-tax rate was about negative seven. That's a low real rate. So the point is we have a long way to go. And um, it doesn't matter, you know, people are interested in whether the Fed's going to pursue a negative interest rate policy, take the target rate on Fed funds below zero. Legally, they could. It's already been done in Europe and Switzerland, Japan, a few other places. I don't necessarily forecast that. I don't think the Fed necessarily th wants to go there but you can have negative yield to maturity on a 10-year note just when that, whenever the premium is greater than the present value of the coupons it's a negative yield to maturity so you can get there you can get deeply negative rates in secondary market trading regardless of what the fed does and that will happen and so you know in the dbo one dollar value of one basis point is higher as the absolute level of rates gets lower that's just you know duration just bond math 101. So we're going to have huge capital gains in 10-year notes as the yield to maturity goes, you know, towards negative 1%. But that's going to be an enormous boost for gold. Uh, and we're not, we're not even there yet. We're seeing these, uh, we're seeing kind of a spike in gold prices when, they, when real rates are still, you know, relatively high. They're only mildly negative. I was declarative when I said printing money does not cause inflation, and it doesn't. Uh, again, I'll just use the last 12 years as, as Exhibit A. I, we should probably relate to the viewers what does cause inflation. And the answer is velocity. 
the turnover of money, the lending and the spending. But the problem is velocity is a psychological phenomenon. The Fed can stick the landing on money supply. They can get it down to a couple of decimal places if they want. But if you want to control velocity, which is the key, that's psychological. So, so what you have to do is change the psychology. Well, what is the psychology right now? It's deflationary. Uh, the savings rate in May was 33%. You know, it had it had been going up. It kind of made its way like from 4% to 7%, but then it spiked to 33%. Well, savings is a good thing. You can drive an economy if you can convert savings into investment. And furthermore, if the investment is productive, unlike what China's doing. Uh, but I was we got some infrastructure or some other projects, R&D, that, that, that would be productive. That can drive an economy. You don't have to drive an economy on consumption. You can drive an economy on productive investment. But the problem is twofold. Number one, it, it has a much longer time frame. That's a five, seven year time frame. And it comes in the short run, at least at the expense of consumption. Our economy is driven 70% by consumption. If you substitute savings for consumption, you're killing velocity. Because if I put my money in the bank and leave it there, the velocity is zero. And I remind people $5 trillion or $6 trillion times zero is zero. You can print all the money you want, but if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. And so the question is, how do you how do you change the psychology? How do you get the and by the way, it makes sense to say if you're unemployed, you better be saving because you're maybe lucky if you can pay the rent. Uh, but even people who are working or still have their jobs, they're worried. Maybe I'm next. You know, maybe they fired a the guy down the hall, but maybe I'm next. And so maybe I better save more just in case, you know, and so forth. So and that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that doesn't make sense. That makes a lot of sense. But understand what it means. It's deflationary. It reduces velocity. It offsets the increase in the money supply. And it's very hard to get out of. I mean, you know, Keynes called a liquidity trap. And he was right. That's what it is. So how do you change the psychology? Well, you need you need something big. You need something dramatic that's going to get people to say, wait a second, what's going on here? Well, one of them would be a $5,000 price for gold. What has been happening in the U.S. economy? The Fed prints all this money, yet that money doesn't lose a lot of value. Look at the exchange rate of the dollar versus other currencies. We've had this massive explosion of money printing, big increase in the Fed's balance sheet. But on a relative basis, the dollar hasn't lost a lot of value relative to other currencies, despite the fact that we've dramatically increased the supply. Imagine if the United States existed as an island we didn't trade with any other nation so any money the federal reserve printed just stayed within our borders it didn't go anywhere right and so the only stuff you could buy with the money the fed printed was the stuff that we made here domestically because that was the only source of goods well obviously the effect would have been much different because if the fed prints a bunch of money and we don't have any stuff we're not producing we don't have factories making stuff then the prices are obviously going to go way up. But there was kind of like an escape valve that allowed the Fed to print a lot of money and it not push up the price of goods. And that was the fact that we have a whole world out there that was able to produce the goods that the U.S. economy couldn't. And we were able to take all the money that the Federal Reserve printed and then use that money to buy all those goods that were made outside the United States. So the Fed prints money, right? the government gets it, sends it to Americans. Americans take that money and buy Chinese goods with it. And now the Chinese send us their goods and we send the Chinese our money. So the money the Fed creates is shipped abroad. So it's not in America bidding up prices, but now the goods that the Chinese produced they get shipped to America. So now we have all those extra goods to keep a lid on prices. And if you look at the breakdown of the CPI between goods and services, if you just look at services, you've seen a substantial increase in prices, even with the government rigging the CPI, because the cost of services has actually risen by more than what the government admits. But if you strip out goods, you'll see a much bigger increase in prices. Why? Because we can't easily import those services. There isn't a foreign alternative. You can't outsource that stuff because the services have to be performed locally. But when it comes to goods, more and more goods have been outsourced to cheaper production economies like China. And so that's 
kept the lid on goods prices. And so when you average the goods prices with the service prices, that's kept the measured rate of inflation lower. I mean, think about the low production costs in a country like China, which, you know, 20 years ago, they were just starting out. They went through a long period of time where they had a communist system, not just in name, but in practice. And so you had a lot of very poor people. And as they began to embrace capitalism, wages started at a very low level. And of course, they didn't have a lot of the rules and regulations that we had. Uh, They didn't have all these environmental protections. And so the cost of manufacturing and the cost of labor, capital was all much lower in a country like China. And so we were able to outsource that production in order to keep costs down even as the federal reserve was printing money and of course the money that we were printing we were sending abroad see now normally this wouldn't work because if you ran a big trade deficit like the one the u.s is running your currency would crash because your trading partners would have all this currency but they'd have nothing to buy because the whole purpose of trade is that you export to import you have a concept of comparative advantage. And if as a nation, there are certain things that you can produce efficiently and there are other things that you can't, rather than producing everything, you produce just what you can make efficiently and then you trade that for the things that you don't produce efficiently because maybe your trading partner can produce that more efficiently. And so by everybody concentrating on what they make efficiently and then trading everybody ends up with more stuff higher living standards lower prices but the goal of your exports is to pay for your imports you don't just export for the sake of exporting that's just a waste of resources you export to pay for your imports but what about america you've got china and other countries exporting to the united states they're not getting imports they're getting dollars and because the u.s is the reserve currency those dollars are actually valuable. And so our trading partners are content or have been in the past to exchange the products that they produce for the money that we print. Now, their willingness to continue to do that and pursue this arrangement, I think, is coming to an end. I think the world is going to tire of exchanging real goods for our paper, especially when they understand how much less that paper is going to be worth in the future than it is now when they realize the box that the Fed is in with respect to its ability to control inflation and the fact that government deficits are going to keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger, putting more and more pressure on the Federal Reserve to monetize those deficits. And in fact, the reason that the deficits were able to get so big in the first place was because of this arrangement, because foreigners were willing to hold on to our U.S. treasuries and keep interest rates artificially low. That emboldened the government to go even deeper into debt, because normally a government that was this profligate would be punished by higher interest rates and that punishment would change their behavior and cause more fiscal responsibility. But we never got punished. And as a result of that, we continue to pursue even more reckless policies than we had in the past. And so foreigners actually helped encourage this. And ultimately now they're going to be the ones that are going to put on the brakes because they're going to stop enabling all of this debt. But It's going to be the Federal Reserve that is going to ultimately replace foreign buyers of U.S. treasuries. But of course, when foreigners buy U.S. treasuries, there's no new dollars created. They buy treasuries with the dollars that already exist. But when the Federal Reserve has to buy those treasuries, they have to produce even more dollars to finance it, which is inflation. And of course, if those dollars stay here, if they're not exported, then they are going to be bidding up prices. And this is what Powell doesn't understand. We are not going to be able to continue to export our inflation to the degree that we did. And we're going to start to see goods prices rising now. And of course, even if the Fed hadn't increased the pace of its money printing, the benefits of outsourcing our production to countries like China was bound to 
diminish over time as Chinese wages go up, as production costs go up. There is less of a benefit of continuing to shift production abroad. And of course, as we've shifted more and more production abroad, there's less incremental benefit from shifting more. See, in the early days of outsourcing, we got a lot of bang for the buck. But over time, that impact is lessened. And so the benefit that we got of having our consumer prices reduced as a result of that is also getting diminished. So it was going to happen anyway, but we've now dramatically accelerated it.